Hello, hi guys. We are at uh, Alchemist, hanging out with the Mulberry Project team. We're back in Kenya for, is it the second or the third time? Second time. Second time. Well, sort of. Sort of, sort of. We were here for a month in September last year. We came back last May for a 12 day event at the Capitol Club. And now we're here for three more months. Three more months? So tell us more about Mulberry Project. What is Mulberry Project about? So, Mulberry Project is about providing a unique experience. An experience that you're not going to find in most parts of the world. Certainly not in, uh, in the States, but especially when you're abroad. It's really about finding a cocktail tailored and suited for every guest that comes into the bar. That's what we're about. We don't have a set menu. Rather, we let you choose from a base of spirits. And the interesting thing is that because we're a pop-up bar that travels around the world, we don't have the same menu everywhere that we go to. For example, I started working for Mulberry Project in Zanzibar, where we served primarily gin and rum cocktails. In Tulum, to represent, of course, the local spirits available in Mexico, we serve tequila and mezcal in addition to rum. In Zanz uh, here in uh, Nairobi, we actually have a much larger selection of base spirits to choose from. Vodka, gin, rum, tequila, scotch, whiskey, cognac. Um, and that's just step one. Step two, typically we have 20 to 30 ingredients you can choose from to add to that base spirit. Um, and this is where we really get to reflect the local produce and flavors that are available in every country that we go to. For example, you know, we have jackfruit, rosemary, sage, basil, lychee, coconut. And this is really, these are ingredients that are sourced locally and that are fresh. Um, which is going to give our cocktails a very, very sort of refreshing and nuanced approach and flavor. Step three for us is usually the style to drink. Maybe something sweet or sour, stirred, or even blended. Tell us more about how you got into Mulberry Project and um, what is the future for Mulberry Project like? Mulberry Project. So, I actually, I had a really good friend who was bartending in Tulum last summer. Um, and uh, when he heard that Mulberry Park was doing, uh, well, their next pop-up in Zanzibar, which we did last December through March for the first time, he sort of got me in contact uh, with Mulberry Project, and he passed my resume along, and that's how I started getting involved with them, having a conversation and dialogue, let's make Zanzibar happen. Um, a couple of months after that, uh, I was on a plane to Tanzania, Dar es Salaam. Um, and we opened up our first pop-up in uh, Zanzibar. One, two, three, go. So I had been bartending for seven years in the States between uh, the East Coast, Boston and Philadelphia. But I really wanted the opportunity to travel and see the world and experience different cultures. So when the opportunity popped up to do Mulberry Project, I jumped out. What has been your favorite city to be in? So I've worked for Mulberry Project in three different countries, three different locations. So Zanzibar was first, then Tulum, and now I'm here in Nairobi for three months. Okay. Each of those was three months for me. Um, so far, I have to say, we've been in Nairobi for a week and a half exactly, and this has been my favorite bar that I've worked at, and my favorite destination, my favorite city, hands down. Um, there's such a warmth and friendliness to everyone that we've met. And actually, it's been so exciting to be back here because not only are we excited to be back here, but everybody else has been so excited to have us back. What's your favorite spirit? My favorite spirit. When I first started uh, drinking and learning how to drink and bartending, I spent a lot of time with whiskey. A lot of time. My go-to cocktail would be uh, Manhattan, sometimes Old Fashions, 
Um, once I started really getting uh, involved with the industry and bartending, I learned to appreciate the versatility of rum. Yeah. Uh, if you ask me, one of my favorite cocktails is uh, a daiquiri, classic daiquiri. Um, I usually prefer with a blend of rums. Uh, a rum old fashioned is also really good when you have a, a good and uh, intentional blend of rums as well. Um, it's one of those categories of spirits that it can be so broad that you really have such a, a large spectrum of spirits within just one category. So you spoke about rum being a large category, right? So talk to us about tiki culture because most people don't seem to understand what tiki culture is all about. What? Tiki culture. Tiki cocktails. Yeah. Ah, tiki cocktails are a bit of a, a challenge to try to explain them to people. What, what constitutes a tiki cocktail? How is that different than uh, just a tropical drink or a sour drink? Um, it's, uh, it's become such a thing, especially in the States, that there is a whole culture around tiki. Um, tiki bars really came about in the 1950s. Um, such places in California that were owned by Dutch, uh, Don the Beach Comer and Trader Vic tried to capture an aesthetic um, that expats from World War II and the wars in, uh, during that time were coming into contact with in Polynesia and in other uh, exotic islands and locations. So in that sense, TV culture is really about capturing a, a feeling, an aesthetic. I think that it's developed definitely into a style of drinks that's usually marked by complex blends of spirits, not just restricted to rum, but also sherry and cognac and gin are very typical tiki uh, elements along with absinthe. Uh, so it's in that sense you have a lot to work with. Uh, but you're using usually sour, a sour ingredient. Do you classify pina colada as a tiki cocktail? There are a lot of people that wouldn't. Why not? Well, there is no sour element to pina colada. It's a tropical drink, but not necessarily a tiki drink. Um, so a complex blend of spirits, so usually tiki cocktails can be spirit forward, sour, and uh, usually have an element of spice to them as well. You, t you spoke about daiquiri being one of, the, one of your favorite cocktails, right? And you also spoke about uh, blended rums. Can you be able to tell guys your experience of rum, your journey towards rum, and uh, what have you discovered, you know, between the column and the pot distilled type of rum, you know, what is your preference? It, it really depends on what you're going for. If you want to talk about column still rums and pot still rums, I think they both have their place. One's going to be cleaner, smoother, one's going to be more full body. Um, and so that's how actually you can achieve an even greater range of cocktails if you're mixing between both of them. Um, I tend to go with, for old fashions, base of a, a calm still rum with the addition of a pot still rum because then you can achieve a nice balance between bold and light. It really, that's, that's, that's what's amazing about rum. There's so much versatility in the category. Do you think rum is a serious category like whiskey? I think that it's finding that market. It wasn't always, it, it doesn't, rum hasn't always had the status that whiskey has had. Um, especially considering that there's a whole history with the consumption of whiskey in the States. Let me backtrack, because it, it's really interesting. It, in the United States, whiskey and rum sort of share similar trajectories. Um, rum became very popular in New England. Uh, because of sugarcane that was going into the Caribbean. Um, whiskey was more of a sort of a poor man's spirit. 
but they both enjoy that similar status. Um, nowadays, people are seeing that aged rums and blended rums can be enjoyed on their own as neat spirits, much like whiskey can be. And when you have that sort of status, you can enjoy this as a neat spirit. It indicates a high quality and uh, good flavors, and that's something that people are starting to get into with rum. Um, talk to us about uh, the low ABV and uh, you know craft cocktail programs are coming up for guys who have either illnesses or uh, trying to get away from alcohol. What's your experience like? What is the one thing you can encourage guys about? So I think this is a very important movement that's happened within the last five years. It's, it's really started to take off within the last five years or so in the cocktail industry. Um, people realizing that cocktails are meant to be enjoyed. They're meant to be sit. You sit down with a cocktail um, and you do it because you're experiencing all the different flavors in the cocktail. You're not shooting it, you're not drinking it quickly. You're enjoying it. Lord Hickey cocktails, or even session cocktails as they can be called, were sort of one way for people to sit down and enjoy a lot of different cocktails without necessarily having to get drunk or intoxicated. Um, and I think that's important if you care about cocktails, if you care about cocktail culture. And it's important to realize you can enjoy different cocktails, different levels of mixing, and not have to be intoxicated afterwards. Um, and so there's this really, now you're seeing things like low ABV margaritas, or low ABV daiquiris, or just in general, it's very easy nowadays to swap out tequila in a margarita for something like sherry especially a, a, a manzanilla sherry or, or nice dry sherry with maybe a little bit of tequila to still bring out the agave flavor that you would want to see in a margarita. But in doing so, you've reduced the ABV in that cocktail by a lot. Um, and it means that you can enjoy more of them. And also, you're experiencing more nuanced flavors. Sherry in a margarita, for example, the saltiness in a manzanilla sherry is going to give you different qualities that you wouldn't necessarily get from a tequila. So it's not just about reducing the alcohol, but getting different flavors and being able to enjoy them. Um, what's the advice you can give to young bartenders who are coming up? My advice for young bartenders is that uh, school is important. Where you're getting from, your information from is important if you're a serious bartender. But the best place to learn is behind the bar. Not just from uh, your guests can actually be a very good source of learning if you're interacting with them, if you're getting feedback from them. But also to learn from the people that have come before you, I think is important. Um, Bars have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's sort of a tradition that gets handed down. Pay attention to that tradition and where where what we're doing comes from. But also don't forget to look forward and to innovate and to realize that you're not restricted to what came before you. You have the freedom to do something new and something different. Um, that's sort of the approach to take with blood baby cocktails. It's not something that people are necessarily used to. It's part of the innovation. It's part of thinking forward and thinking ahead. Um, another question. There's a rise of CBD in cocktails. What's your thought on it? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think there has been enough scientific reports on whether CBD is or has any useful medicinal effects. 
I think that it does work for some people. I've heard that CBD can do such things as help um, control seizures for epileptics, um, can reduce anxiety, can reduce pain. I think that if it works for you, that's a good thing. Um, however, I don't condone or uh, support either approach. So you've not done a cocktail with CBD anywhere so far? I have personally not had one. I have not made one. I know that they exist. I know that they're out there. Uh, it's, you know, it's also part of that innovation and that ability to move ahead and find new grounds and new frontier. Um, of course, you can drink a cocktail for the way that it tastes, for the flavors that you're getting. But alcohol also is a drug. CBD is a drug. They both have effects. Uh, they change your state of mind, they change your mood. Um, to say that you can't use one or the other would not be fair. So, uh, if it works for you, if you want to try that, that is up to you. Uh, one, one, one more question. What's the most bastardized cocktail you've seen in bars? Oh. <laughs> it depends where you are. <laughs> um, it, but I, I think a really good example, we're talking about tiki cocktails. My time is, is, oh man. You see so many different versions of a Mai Tai. Um, ones with pineapple juice, ones with, you know, orange juice. They're maybe using equal parts, light rum and dark rum. It's a cocktail that has, um, its origins have been traced back, as we were talking about earlier, to, to Don the Beach Comer, that era of the cocktail movement. And it, originally, it was uh, just a few simple ingredients. It was a specific blend of rum. It was orchard or Orgeat. almond syrup, triple sec, lime. It was a simple, beautiful, well-balanced cocktail. Now you see it somewhere along <laughs> the last 60 or so years, it turned into a a cocktail that you can get in a bar with a little umbrella in it and it doesn't taste anything like what the original tasted like. I think that not many people know what the original Mai Tai was. At the end of the day, you can always add your own twist and your own spin and if you ask for a Mai Tai here, I might add a few ingredients but try and stay as close as possible to that original recipe. Because there's a reason it was made that way. There's, there's a reason it was just those few simple ingredients. Um, yeah, so at the end of the day, it's about what you like to drink. If you like your Mai Tai with pineapple juice. Thoughts on sustain sustainability? Sustainability behind the bar? Yeah. It's a, it's a hard balance between what people have come to expect in terms of service and what we want to do to be responsible for the environment. Um, most people are still asking for straws behind the bar, or well, when they're in a bar setting, they're asking for straws. And here we don't use straws. In a lot of our bars, we don't use straws anymore because of the environmental Straws is just one example, but if you're, if you're going into, you know, how much waste is there from the production of ice, you know, from the bottles that we use, plastic or otherwise, um, I think that a lot of bars have taken the initiative to start doing away with certain things, like straws, like plastic bottles, we're using as many containers and receptacles as we can. Um, but it's still a struggle, especially in countries where there isn't really a bar culture. You may not necessarily have people that are thinking, okay, how can we reduce waste? How can we make this more efficient? How can we have a lesser impact on the environment? Thank you.
One last thing. What do you want to tell guys? It's a wrap, right? What do I want to tell what? What do you want to tell the guys outside there about cocktail culture? Something specific? Any, anything. Just anything. Anything. Yeah, what has been your experience about cocktail culture across the world? I started um, having an interest in cocktails when I realized how worldly of an experience it is. In a cocktail you could have an ingredient that comes from Italy and Spain and maybe the Caribbean. All on the same all on the same drink. Yeah, cocktails really for me became an opportunity to enjoy different flavors around the world. Which is why it became a very special experience for me when I could not only experience the world in a cocktail, but also experience it physically by going around and traveling and trying different things. Um, I think it's important to remember that about cocktails, that they were always a mixture of different cultures, not just spirits, but each spirit represents and has such a history behind it, and a history that is not restricted to one country or one place at one time, but throughout all the history of humanity. When you sit down and you have a cocktail at a bar, you're drinking a bit of human history, and you're drinking a history that pertains to all the world. And it's important to remember that when you're sitting down with a glass. You have a little bit of plurality and the world in your hands. Would you like to taste some as well? You taste first. It's definitely a lot lighter and more viscous than some aperitifs that are that I'm used to that could be a little bit more syrupy. Um, but it has a really good flavor. It's good because this could actually constitute the base of the cocktail. Yes. As opposed to just a modifier. So, for example, in a like in a nod, like in a low ABV cocktail that uses sherry as its base, this could actually work very nicely. It's a whole range of ingredients, but one of the characteristics and flavors that I'm getting from this is a little bit of a chamomile as well. So I think that we can make something really nice with this and uh, actually some watermelon juice, some fresh watermelon juice. So let's see what you can do. So for this uh, cocktail, we're going to try something a little bit tropical, almost tiki inspired, but without any alcohol, using Everleaf as our base. Start with a bit of lime. Get our sour element. Uh, cinnamon syrup. This is a flash of Bordeaux. Watermelon as the primary flavor here to complement those chamomile notes that I got in the Everleaf. We use watermelon in the glass without shaking it so that we don't damage the delicate flavors in the watermelon.
have a bit of garnish. What's the name of the cocktail? That's, that's an interesting question. <laughs> we can call this the uh, Watermelon Sunrise. Awesome. <laughs>